In this episode of Restore It, I'm going to bring you up to date on the progress we've made in the new workshop. You might have seen some new things in the background of the M40 project episodes, so in this video you'll see how everything came about. This is going back a few weeks, just after the second episode in the series was posted. Half of the floor was painted, in the wrong colour, and the workbenches were in place with their shelves and lights fitted. It was now a case of organising all of the tools and consumables onto their designated benches. I knew I wanted this one to be the paint preparation bench, so I started gathering and sorting all of the paint related stuff, as well as the paint itself. Soon I'll get a metal cabinet and store all of the paint in that because it's much safer than this and it will save the bench space. As for the rest of the workbenches, it was a case of clearing everything onto the floor and then back onto the workbenches in their final place. This went on for some time. Although I had bought the wrong shade of grey, I committed to finishing the entire workshop, one for my self-proclaimed OCD, and two because I had a new plan. What I'm going to do is go over most of the dark grey with the light grey, and leave a dark pathway around the outside of the room and near the workbenches. To get to the rest of the floor, we first had to clear a small skip pile we created when we stripped everything out. For now, we painted around the car lift as it was due to go up the next day, and it was a serious pain to move. The final bit of rendering was put off till the very last minute. I've got no real practice at this unlike Doug, so I left him to do it. Whilst that was getting done, I continued with the extremely long task of sorting each item, some of which I'll use once a year if that but it seems like when you need a tool the most, you don't have it. I'm trying to overcome that by getting as many tools as I can possibly afford, but I think it will never end. This isn't necessarily the final place for all of these tools. At this point, I just wanted to get them somewhat in place and have the main area clear for the car lift. In total, there were a few long days just sorting piles of stuff out. After a few full days, this is where we were at. The floor was repaired and 90% painted in dark grey. The tools were almost sorted and the lift was ready to be installed. Air and water outlets are going to be installed near all of these tools as well as throughout the rest of the workshop. Eventually, I made it to the end of all of the piles and could move on knowing that everything was at an arm's reach. As I was finishing that up, Doug continued to cover the old cream walls with fresh brilliant white. One thing you might have seen in the background of the recent episodes and my Instagram is this Colchester lathe. I brought this from a guy who had owned it for 28 years after buying it from the British Army who bought it brand new. Thankfully I had a forklift on hand to move it into the workshop. Rob, the engineer buddy of the guy who sold it to me, walked me around the lathe and its various features. Whilst I paid for the goods on the phone, it was shifted more towards its final resting place, which would involve moving a workbench. 
I wanted to use the natural light from this window at the back to light the lathe during the day when most if not all of the work would be carried out. Obviously it will be turned around with its back up against the window, but I thought I'd quickly show you around the lathe. So this is the Colchester Student Mark 1 from 1951, which makes it 70 years old this year. This is a 6 inch lathe, which refers to the centre height, and the bed length between the centres is 24 inches, so it's known as a 6 by 24 inch lathe. It's a 3 phase, I think 380, maybe 415 volt motor in there that needs to be hooked up to the 3 phase the workshop has. It's currently fitted with a 3 draw automatic chuck, a Colchester taper attachment, I think a Morse taper 5 headstock, there seems to be some confusion about the definite size of this, so I'm going to measure it myself. It was slightly dismantled before it was shipped to me. This Colchester DRO was fitted and functioning, so that needs to be installed as well as the original lamp. It also came with some extras. A 4 jaw automatic chuck, two fixed steadies, the C-spanner, some reverse jaws, some tooling, and some metal blocks to help level it. I was told by both the previous owner and Rob that the centre points between the headstock and the tailstock were aligned within a quarter of a thou which just goes to show the level of build quality Colchester were producing 70 plus years ago. I'm going to leave a link in the description to a video of these lathes getting made in the Colchester factory. It blew my mind how these machines were produced, and I'm super grateful to now own one. Whilst on the subject of this lathe, I wanted to get a manual for it, so I had a look online and guess who popped up? Emanuel Online. Not only do they do cars, trucks, bikes, planes, you name it, they of course had one for the Colchester student, a PDF version of the original which I promptly downloaded. What I mainly use Emanuel Online for is their factory style workshop repair manuals for cars. Like this one. This is an interactive manual for many BMW models including the E30. These are the kind of interactive manuals technicians use at dealerships to diagnose and repair customers cars. Having one of these makes life so much easier. They contain step by step instructions with pictures, diagrams and talk specs that cover everything you need to know about a particular vehicle. They'll tell you if you need special tools or equipment to complete a particular task and how to properly set up and use those tools and equipment. These manuals will show you how to do practically any job you can think of. And what's good about eManual Online is that you can get a manual for almost any car in existence. So to check these out, click the link at the top of the video description. These things usually sell for around only $20, but I'm going to leave a discount code down there for 30% off your entire order. You can download all of your manuals to any computer or smartphone and have them for the rest of your wrenching days. They hold invaluable information that can save you a ton of money and give you the knowledge and confidence to start your own restoration. Thanks to Emanuel Online for sponsoring this episode and helping people like me and you to better understand our cars. Let's get back to the workshop. Another piece of equipment I felt like I needed was a hoist. Firstly, to get things onto the mezzanine whilst we don't have stairs, although they are in the plan, and secondly, to move dead cars and other heavy things around the workshop. This one is rated for 450 kilograms and was only 60 pounds. It did, however, arrive with a broken plug attached to a very short power cable. I opened it up, removed it and replaced it with a much longer cable and working plug. So you know when something is too good to ignore, this was definitely one of those times. I found this 1986 E30 chassis for sale online for £200. £200! When I contacted the guy, he said, you can have it for free if you pick it up soon. I went straight to a delivery comparison site and found a transporter who'd pick it up and drop it off for 200 quid, so I gave it to him instead. It's got a bit of damage on the tail and rear left quarter panels, but nothing too major. It was last taxed in 2002, so I think it's been off the road for 19 years. I'm surprised it's still here, I'm surprised it still exists. It's been set outside for a long time, so I think it's a bit of a wreck, but it's still an E30 and one I plan to save someday. Maybe it would make a good track car, an OEM plus car, or even a factory finish restoration. I pretty much bought this sight unseen and didn't know what I was getting. I wasn't expecting the bumpers, the boot lid, the seats, the dash and trim. I certainly wasn't expecting houndstooth seats and door cards, as rotten as they are. But most of all, I was not expecting it to be a 325i Sport. That's a bargain, if you ask me. I'm going to strip everything off it and bring them inside to at least let them dry for the time being. I've got a cover for the shell on its way, as we all know what the weather in the UK is like. Not normally this snowy, but just as wet. One thing the workshop and myself desperately needed was a car lift. I didn't feel like lifting it up myself, so I paid a guy who'd been doing it for 40 years to come to the workshop and tell me that I would indeed be lifting it up, along with Doug. I thought he was going to come with a team of people 
but it turned out we were a part of the team. Which I'm not going to lie, kind of scared the hell out of me. I had tried to move one of the posts on my own when I first moved in, and I couldn't even budget a centimetre. It felt impossible. And all of a sudden, this guy's telling us we're going to be lifting it up, without any crane, forklift or anything. After he removed the arms, and with the help of some big pry bars, an engine lift and a small stool, we were able to lift both posts up between the three of us. Which actually shocked me, I didn't think we were going to be able to do it, I didn't think I was strong enough. For the next one I'd get the same help again, because with the service came a full bottle of fluid. He fixed the many small issues the lift had, and told me about a problem with the lock button that I wouldn't have picked up on. He also suggested I face the lift towards the shutters, for easy access for running and of course non-running cars. Before it was installed, I thought this was a three phase lift, but it turns out it's only a two phase, so I can literally plug it into the wall and get it to work, but I think as soon as it's got a car on it and it's under load, it will demand more power and blow the fuse. So as fun as it was to try it out, I'm getting it hooked up to the mains at the same time the lathe is done. Once that was in, we continued with the white paint. We wanted to get this section done as the workbench we moved from where the lathe now is, is going here, where the other car lift might be going. The camera kind of messed up multiple times, but this is what it ended up like. For now, I'm keeping the other touring here, but I think it's a really good place for a second lift. Let me know what you think down in the comments. I could have one to the left of the lift I just installed, but this one's more aligned with the door and just seems like dead space. I saw a few of you mention this in the last episode, but don't worry, the plan was always to paint all the way to the roof. There was just so much painting to do, I had to prioritise other things first. I'll quickly summarise this as I think we've seen enough painting in this series so far. Plus the camera this day just did not want to film painting, it had enough, it had, had enough of filming painting. And there we go, what a difference it's done for the lighting already. Even though it's still awful, I think once the LEDs are in, the combination of the white walls and the LEDs, it will make a massive difference. Off camera, I started building some of the shelving I have to store some of the parts from the M40 project, but I'm going to need a lot more than this. I think I'll fill the mezzanine with as many shelves as I can fit up there to maximise its space. The white paint really does make a difference. It was a lot of effort, but definitely worth it in the end. Whilst I'm over here, I'll update you on the heater situation. I think I might have told you this, but I can't remember. I think it works and everything is fine, it just doesn't or didn't have an oil tank fitted. Luckily, I found a 600 litre oil tank out the back. I need to hook it up to the pipe, fill it up and fingers crossed it will keep me warm for the rest of the winter and into spring. The spray booth was starting to make its way to the top of my list. The first obvious issue was the large hole in the side, hidden by these two large hole sized pieces. We screwed the smaller one of the two over the opening and then on the inside it was sealed with acrylic sealant. The floor in here was made up of the same type of wood that I ripped off the walls in the beginning horrible stuff that traps dust and can't get wet. I decided to go back to concrete and start again on a new floor. If anyone's got any suggestions, I'm open to ideas, please leave them down in the comments. But I might just stick with Colad floor for booth.
I didn't think we had enough to make this last bit of dark grey happen, but the boys squeezed and scraped every last bit to make it happen, and we finished the wrong colour. Feels good. Now I can't wait for the correct one to be done, which shouldn't take as long. So that pretty much brings you up to date. Minus a little bit of work on the lights, we've now started swapping out the horrible fluorescence for some LED panels. So next episode you'll see those new lights going in, I'll have the lathe and lift hooked up and working, and the spray booth pretty much complete with new plasterboard, new filters, wall lights and air piped in. So join me then as we get this workshop to where it needs to be. In the meantime there might be a touring episode or two, that's coming along nicely, soon I'll stop removing things and start restoring them, starting with the engine series, so I look forward to that, and there's definitely going to be a few more of these episodes to come. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.